How are you today? Good. I'm so glad to see you in church. Really a privilege to be part of a church and to be able to come all together. Okay, so I'm, I'm very happy for that. Before I start speaking, I would like to pray. So I will invite you to bow your head so we can pray. Father, thank you so much for the Sabbath day you are giving to us. Now, Lord, we are coming together to worship you, and we are very happy and excited about it. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you poured upon us during the week that is ending today. Thank you for bringing us in this uh, sunny day to worship you in your church. Bless your word that is going to be shared with our friends today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everything is on, so let's see if it's working or not. Um, if not, I will stay here. You can hear me properly, right? Correct. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you can hear because this morning we are going to talk about not being able to see for a while. It is said that 2.2 billion people around the world has challenges with their sight. They are permanently blind or they see with only one eye or they need to use these kind of things to be able to see far, middle distance, and short for reading. If I remove this, I cannot read anything from this. I realized that I needed longer, longer arms a few years back. And then the solution was this. But most of you that use these things realize that you're trying to delay it as much as you can. Because there's a stigma attached to it. You are getting old, you cannot see properly, and all this kind of thing. But others were born already with sight issues. And they need to wear glasses even from very, very young age and goes with them the whole life. Sometimes surgery helps them, but 2.2 billion people, it's quite a lot. What about our spiritual blindness? We cannot see properly sometimes. Sometimes we pray we would like to have to see through God's eyes, sometimes it's our prayer, so we can see in a different way. So this morning, I would like to invite you to open your Bibles in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 10. And we are going to read the story that is there from verse 46 to 50, 52. I'm using the God's Word version or translation. There is many others you can use uh, whatever you want. And I'm going to read, and then we are going to try to go verse by verse and see what we can learn and what I would like to share with you this morning. Uh, 46 said, Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and many people were leaving Jericho, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that Jesus from Nazareth was passing by, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The people told him to be quiet, but he shouted even louder, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. They called the blind man and told him, cheer up, get up. He's calling you. The blind man threw off his coat, jumped up, and went to Jesus. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, teacher, I want to see again. Jesus told him, go, your faith has made you well. At once he could see again, and he followed Jesus on the road. Amazing story. I have read it. I have meditated upon this since I was small. I think it's one of the stories from my childhood that I always remember. That encounter with Jesus, Jesus that changed the life of someone. 
What I would like to notice in verse 46 is that Jesus is on a move. Jesus is alive. This is the first thing that came to my mind when, when I can read here, then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciple and many others were living. They were moving. And Jesus is moving among us today. He's moving outside. He's moving everywhere. Sometimes we don't think about it, but he's still moving. And there was him, the blind man, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. He was sitting by the road. I would like to think about Jesus was not moving alone. Jesus was moving with plenty of people, a good crowd of them. And you know, in a crowd, you can ha have all kind of people. You don't know their motives. They are, they are joining the crowd. Sometimes it's curiosity. Sometimes they want to see what is going on. Sometimes they, they don't know, but they are there. And others are really understand why they are there, and they want to be there. And they were all moving together. When you look, you can see this is Jesus' people. You can see, as a group, all of them are moving with them. So you might think they think in the same way, they do the same things. They are all moving together. And there was our friend Bartimaeus. He was a blind person. And if you know, at the time of Jesus, having diseases or some sort of disability was the reason of think of that person as a sinner. It was immediately an stigma. This person has this problem because of his sin or his parents' sin. So immediately there was a barrier on that person. On top of that, he was a what? A beggar. Not a very good condition, not at all. Said so this person is blind, is a beggar, is rejected. However, the verse 46 is telling his name. This is not very often that happened. Only when somebody is recognized, the name is given. And he seems to be the son of somebody by name Timaeus. And he was the son of Timaeus, as the Bible said. That's why he said Bar Timaeus. Bar means son, and his father's name was Timaeus. So it means that he was somebody also before probably being a blind and a beggar, some kind of outcast of the society who couldn't stay probably for shame with his family and he decided to go away on his own and be begging by the road and living from the people. Now we move to verse 47. When he heard that Jesus from Nazareth was passing by, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He was by the road. For sure, many people was passing by and talking, and he heard the name of Jesus. Some of them maybe stopped to give some coins, and he asked, who is that Jesus? You are talking about Jesus. And they probably told him, oh, this is a new... Uh, a prophet, uh, he's performing miracles, he's saying this, he's saying that, and perhaps many people stop and he ask. We don't know how many, but he knew about Jesus of Nazareth. And in his heart, for sure, it started to grow the hope that something, something different is happening around those dusty roads those days. It's interesting that he shout. When you shout, when you are preaching and you want to call the attention of the, probably, the congregation, when you feel that somebody is falling asleep and you want to wake it up, you said, brothers, and you know, everybody wakes up. Why you shout when you want to call the attention of somebody? And he was sitting, remember, by the road. When the people is up there and you are cheating, uh, sorry, shouting for, for load, your voice can be, lost, you know, by the, by the crowd. So he said, Jesus, son of David. For me, what is important here, that he made a faith statement. 
He called him Jesus, son of David. That is a bold statement on its own. And he was calling to the Messiah that everybody knew at that time that was promised to them. He identified among all the people that that was the Messiah and he was calling upon his name. Probably this was his only chance. He didn't know if Jesus will come along the road again. He knew that was from Nazareth. Nazareth was quite far from, from Jericho, was a following up at the Jordan River. Now 48 says, the people told him what? Be quiet. Why do you think the people was doing that? Because of the stigma. You are a sinner. You are a blind person. You are a beggar. How do you dare to call upon the name of the Messiah? Who are you? Now, who was this people? Was the people we identify with Jesus. We identify them with the crowd. We identify them moving together with Jesus. They judge and they said, this person has no right whatsoever to talk to the Son of God. I found myself sometimes in that position, judging people. Myself deciding who should receive the gospel or who should not receive the gospel. I hope my church is not like that. I hope so. That we don't look at the stereotype and we decide who can come through this door or who cannot. Some of them believed that this man wouldn't talk to Jesus. And they decided to silence him. They told him, be quiet. What do you think who you are? You know, you are not part of this club. You are an outsider. You should not. But he was in a mission. Something was lacking in his heart. And he knew that the Son of God was coming through that dusty road. He was coming toward him and he needed to call his attention. And he what? He shouted even louder. Son of David had mercy on me. He really wanted to be heard. Are we that desperate to listen to the voice of God? Or is just that very quiet, long distance that sometimes we cannot even hear properly. We can hear like a Morse code, words here and there. I hope we are not only uh, asking to have the right side, but also being able to listen properly. I do believe that in that crowd there was people moved by the wrong spirit that was asking to this person that was desperate for the master to be quiet and to be silent. But I praise God because in verse 20, uh, 49 Jesus what? Jesus stopped. What amazing. The creator of the universe stopped for one sinner calling upon his name. He stopped in the middle of, we don't know where he was going. There was a lot of people. He knew of the thinking of the time, but he came to make the difference. And he stopped and said, call him. And what happened? They called the blind man and told him, shut up, get up, he is calling you. Hallelujah, Jesus stopped. And I said amen for the people that is encouraging others to come to Jesus. What they said, shut up, be happy. Good news, he stopped for you. Get up, he is calling you. I want to see my church with this attitude. 
welcoming, happy what somebody wants to come after many years, wants to come to church. I'm happy for that. I would like to see my church with that attitude. It doesn't matter who you are, what you have done. I have no right. I'm no better than you. I'm happy you are with us. I'm happy you are worshiping our God all together. In that crowd, you can find these two kind of people, the one that will discourage you, but the ones that are also going to encourage you and will welcome you and will be happy. We are not perfect. It is not a perfect church. I know. I know that. But I hope 99.9% .9 of us will be with this attitude, happy when somebody wants to come, when somebody show more interest and we are ready to share this good news with others. I can imagine when Jesus said, call him, the silence in the air. Jesus was not talking. They were just moving together. Probably the crowd was talking and Jesus was just walking and said, call him out of nowhere, call him. It's amazing because Jesus is stopping for us every day. He's stopping for us today in the same way that he did for Bartimaeus. We need to move on. 50, the blind man threw off his coat. The process of restoration is not only on the call. In this business of salvation, there is always the human part. It's amazing. The creator of the universe wants us to be part of it. Yes, he guaranteed the salvation for us, but there is always something that we need to do. The blind man threw off his coat because what's the thing was stopping him to go to Jesus fast. He knew, I'm still blind. My coat is covered me. If I'm going to Jesus, I may fall and I will miss this opportunity. And he didn't want that to happen, not at all. Not th that day, at least. Maybe he, he fall many times. He's a blind person. He said, this time I don't want it. This time it needs to be different. If this coat is what is stopping me to go to Jesus, I need to throw it away. What is our coat today? What is stopping me to go to Jesus fully? You know your own. I don't know you. I don't know what is in your heart. I don't know what you are dealing with. It may be hard. I know. But there is something that we need to do enable, enable us to go to Jesus. And after he threw off his coat, what he did, he jumped up. What a joyce. What a joyce. He threw it away. Have you felt in your heart once when you have something and Jesus removed it from you? That you feel so light that you want to jump as high as you can? I think that was the feeling. He was already experiencing the transformation in his heart. His faith was moving him. Although the miracle was about to come, was not there yet. Jesus asked him, verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus is stopping for us today and asking the same question. What do you want me to do for you? And he's able and willing to do it for you. Amen. He wants to stop as many times you need it. He will stop and will ask the same question. What do you want? The blind man didn't think twice. Why do you? Why I do? Why I think twice? He said, Lord, ha, I want to see. This is what's the, the burden of my heart. I want to see again. It means that once he was able to see, but he is not able to see anymore. 
When I look at my life, I know. At one point, I see clearly. But in many times in my life, my sight was quite blurry. And in my heart, many times, I have to go on my knees and say, Lord, I want to see again, like Bartimaeus was doing here. How kind is Jesus asking, what do you want? This is not imposing you anything. It's asking you. It's asking you, what do you want? I'm able to do it. What do you want? I'm not giving you the rules, the A, B, and C. I'm asking you, what do you want? And you are free to choose what your question will be. But I'm willing to satisfy the deepest desire of your heart. How gentle is Jesus? How precious is our free will that we can exercise, but how dangerous it could be. Adam and Eve, they had their own taste of the bitterness of misusing the free will. He said, I want to see. I say I want to be transformed. You may say something else. We need to decide how we are going to answer this question. And some of us may need to decide today. May not be tomorrow. We don't know. Through all the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, every sin is about choices. Choices and choices and choices. How we use our free will. Jesus did his part. He stopped. He died for you. And this week, that celebration, the death and the rest of Jesus and the resurrection, he wants to be resurrected in your heart once more. 52. Jesus told him, go, your faith has made you well. At once he could see again, and he followed Jesus on the road. Amen. Jesus didn't take any credit for this. Did you notice that? He credited the man. Your faith may you well. His faith unleashed the power of heaven who restored his sight. And Jesus took no credit for that. Amen. What a change in the life of Bartimaeus. What a power performed the miracle. How amazing is that the same power is available for each one of us. It's no difference because the Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if you believe that this is true, that can happen in your life today. The question is still there. What do you want me to do for you? He wants for you to experience the same transformation. You know why? If you go back to verse 46, and you will see a man sitting by the road. Verse 42, 52, say, and he followed Jesus, where? On the road. It's a huge difference. It's a transformation that happened. It's not the same to be sitting in church and feeling nothing than be fully on. He was by, aside, living off, hands out. Now he was following Jesus on the road. This is the kind of transformation that Jesus can do in your life, can do in my life. It's my prayer that we answer this question. Because Jesus already stopped, already placed the question, and it's for each one of us to answer if we are going to exercise our faith and believe in the free of salvation and share with others the happiness of having Jesus in our heart. May God bless you.